My back is killing me. Years haven't been kind to us, I suppose. I've never related to a game more. Remakes aren't hard to come by these days, and many era-defining games are becoming so long in the tooth that their creators are revisiting them. Some live up to the high standards of the original titles, while others are Pokemon. Redoing a classic is a Herculean task because, as literally every developer who's ever remade a game has said, they need to update it to current standards without taking away from what made the original so special in its own time. Capcom have spent the last few years recreating some of their clunky old main entries from their seminal Resident Evil series, giving RE2 and RE3 new coats of paint and updating the cumbersome tank controls. A potential problem arose when it came time to give Resident Evil 4 a spruce up. Many would have argued that this one didn't actually need to be remade, having pioneered the over-the-shoulder shooting perspective and other modern gameplay sensibilities that we've since seen in the other recent editions, as well as other game series. I didn't even expect it to happen. I thought the VR version of RE4 was an alternative to needlessly remaking the whole thing. When a fully new title was unveiled, I continued to be cynical. RE4 is such a stone-cold classic that still holds up remarkably well to the point it felt like fixing something that wasn't broken. Thankfully, that wasn't the case. I was pleasantly surprised to find that the RE4 remake does its predecessor justice by taking what was great about it and intensifying many of its key elements, while trimming away much of the outdated fat. Revisiting this revamped world of RE4 as a returning player has a thick air of dramatic irony, a literary device in which the audience knows something that the characters don't. Leon remarks that nothing could be big enough to wield a huge hammer he stumbles across, but we know it portends the El Gigante fight. Sometimes it's seeing how old haunts and familiar faces are reframed that's part of the appeal. Saying that, however, a lot of the story beats are remixed. Most of the same events happen, but they'll often have different catalysts or occur in a changed order. So even those who've played the original might find an eyebrow creeping upwards at points when things don't play out in the way you're anticipating. The game isn't afraid to play with your familiarity. It'll subvert your expectations to introduce surprises and sometimes well-earned jump scares. At the very start, you'll stumble across a dead dog caught in a bear trap. This, of course, is a reversion of a well-known and much-loved moment in which Leon frees the animal, only for it to return later to help him in a boss fight as thanks for his kindness. Seeing a dead doggo in its place is a not-so-subtle but ingenious warning that even if you think you know what you're doing, this game is out to prove otherwise, and you should expect the unexpected. Where RE4 Remake really shines in this regard is the characterization. How it takes characters who had once been mired in cringeworthy B-movie tropes and turns them into people who feel human, or otherwise in some cases, but evocative nonetheless. I could ramble on about the beautiful photorealistic visuals, from the twilight woods in which the game begins to Leon Cheekbones Kennedy over here. I could talk about the more fluid controls, more aggressive enemies and increased sense of survival. I could talk about how you can feel the devs retroactively applying the tension of RE7 and RE8 to bring new scares to an already beloved game, but I want to focus on how it sharpens RE4's sometimes monotonous script. I know lines like No thanks, bro and your right hand comes off have become classic tongue-in-cheek quotes and that the toned down campiness will be lamented by some but the darker edge is so much more appealing to me than just rehashing these tired memes a lot of them are still here as well as some good new one-liners there's still this iconic act of self-defenestration and leon at one point tells a sentient suit of armor he's about to go medieval on its ass but overall there's a more straight-laced dare i say mature angle at play from his opening monologue, it's clear that Leon is more troubled than he appeared in the original. In that game, he just recaps what happened in Resident Evil 2 with the destruction of Raccoon City at the hands of the Umbrella Corporation. Here, he actually admits that part of him died that day, how aware he is that he made it out alive when so many didn't, and fills his in about since being put into a government program against his will, leading to this assignment to rescue the president's kidnapped daughter from rural Spain. It seems that Leon is suffering from PTSD and survivor's guilt, which frames his mindset about this mission differently. Instead of just being a window jumping cop out to kick ass and save the girl, he's a man trying to right the wrongs of the past and put his soul at rest. Significantly, we see a deeper bond developing between Leon and the president's daughter, Ashley, who's more personable than the uncanny valley brat of old. She becomes an embodiment of Leon's struggle to heal himself, rather than just an objective. They have almost a big brother little sister dynamic. Even their introductory scene when they jump out of the window is framed more as a trust exercise than a goofy action movie sequence and their partnership blossoms from there. There's playful chat, she even makes a Master of Unlocking reference at one point, and she'll scold him for things like letting off flash grenades in front of her, as well as heartfelt moments too, like when he assures her they'll overcome the infection together, or when he informs her of Luis's death. I love Ashley's smug face during their initial encounter with Salazar, relishing in how her big brother is standing up for her against the tiny tyrant, and even finds the courage to stand up to him with her new ally by her side. 
Near the end of the original, Leon commands Ashley to use the Plagueis removal machine on him, testing it first for safety. In the remake, the infection is incapacitating them both and he refuses to use the machine first, prioritising her well-being over his own. Both work as a reflection of Leon's selfless attitude, but the newer one has a more dramatic delivery that better expresses how the two characters have come to care for each other and carries a greater tone of urgency. It also resolves Leon's aforementioned regrets about being unable to save the people of Raccoon City. He wants things to be different this time, and personal sacrifice to save Ashley here is a touching way of showing it. At one point he even says to Luis, don't worry about me, Ashley is the priority. For all his big gun heroics, it makes this hero feel more human compared to other classic RE protagonists. Ashley's overtime quip at the end of the game is replaced with an offer to have Leon put on her security detail in order to spend more time together, but it comes across as affectionate rather than the more awkward seductive remark it was at the end of the first RE4. Instead of simply shooting her down, Leon now replies that she's capable of handling herself without him after all they've been through, which charmingly rounds off this much warmer relationship instead of hammering in a stunted romantic or sexual overtone. I had originally written a section about Ada here, but the day before I had intended to publish this video, the RE4R Separate Ways DLC was announced, meaning that the video would have been almost instantly outdated, so I held off until I could play that too. Talk about a major script revision. This expansion, which sees Ada tasked with retrieving a Plaga sample for Albert Wesker, has much more of its own identity rather than being the superfluous behind the scenes perspective of the original Separate Ways. Sadly, it fails to make Ada any more of a likeable or relatable character. I've never particularly cared for her, and here she continues to be a cold manipulative blank. She's at least dressed more appropriately this time. She does mention the Raccoon City incident having changed her outlook on life, but doesn't quite go into detail about it in the same way that Leon does. Instead, Ada serves as a conduit for other characters to express themselves. Previously on their speedboat trip to the island, Ada said practically nothing before flashing her arse at the camera and zooming off, to which Leon simply quipped, Women. In the remake, Leon addresses his lingering feelings and possible PTSD as well as confronting Ada about her past deception. She's dryly dismissive and enigmatic as expected, but at least acts as a vessel for the protagonist to project some of his inner thoughts without resorting to the mildly sexist cheesiness of yore. She has a more fleshed out story with Luis, in which they work together to retrieve the Plaga Samber in return for his extraction from the area, him acting as something of a foil to her straight woman. When she also becomes infected though, she reluctantly consents to allowing Luis to retrieve the Plagas resistant medicine for herself as well as Leon and Ashley. The fact that Ada's own humanity is now at stake instead of this just being a mission could have been the basis for a more emotive story as she tried to balance her professionalism with vulnerability and fear for her life, but it still comes across as transactional more than anything else. She originally stated that she was simply trying to make Leon think that he was the primary player while secretly orchestrating events with Machiavellian schemes, and that's all her character is really used for here as well, to represent how little agency the hero has. It's kinda like how Sadler now shows that Leon and Ashley are so easily at his mercy, but we'll get onto that later. The image of Ada helping Luis climb up the rock face and how she easily hookshots herself to the top of the tower while he struggles below are heavily symbolic of how much she's in control, as well as the frequency with which she holds guns to people's heads. It's just a shame that in a game that builds on each character and makes so many of them more three-dimensional, Ada just remains a non-entity. On the subject of Luis, he's given an overhaul too. His cocksure lover-hate personality is still much the same, but you'll play alongside him in more sections than the household shootout this time, so there's more scope for discussion between him and Leon. They have a back and forth as if they were two pals playing co-op together at points. He even stood congratulating me as I played the Merchant's Target Range minigame, like a friend cheering me on at an arcade. His backstory has also been retconned to explain his early life. He was actually brought up in the village by his grandfather, who was infected with the Plagueis and asked the village chief, Mendez, to burn down the house with him inside, which the young Luis silently observed. Fittingly, this has become the building in which you find him bagged up. He then left the village to become a biologist and ended up working for Umbrella, making him complicit in the very viral outbreak that wrecked Leon's life. He seems to be running from this past by fancying himself as Don Quixote, a story that he loved as a child which perhaps takes him back to a simpler time, as though denying his former life by living in a fantasy world. Ironically, Luis's story is quite similar to Leon's. When asked why he's helping Leon and Ashley, Luis replies that it makes him feel better and he doesn't want to see anyone else get hurt. Conversing with Ada, he even says as long as she helps him, he doesn't care if she's working for the devil himself. It's a tongue-in-cheek remark, but unbeknownst to him, she's working for Albert Wesker, once a key player in Umbrella who seeks to further the kind of apocalyptic destruction for which Luis bears a cross. He even thanks Ada for the chance to do good, tragically unaware that this one act of kindness could lead to untold devastation. His death scene now carries much more weight than in the original. His last act is to give Leon a key to the lab where he can help Ashley, before asking Leon if he thinks that people can still change after their past misdeeds. A plea for his own redemption, but it also appears to hit Leon, who himself is battling old demons. This new arc makes his fate far more impactful than Leon melodramatically shouting his name. You were a fine knight, Don Quixote. 
It isn't just the good guys who get this treatment though. The game's main villain, Lord Osmond Sadler, is given deeper connection to the area. It's revealed that his ancestors had been banished for heresy, namely worshipping Las Plagas in an otherwise Christian region, and exiled to the island upon which Sadler would ultimately found the Los Illuminados base of operations. I wouldn't say this makes Sadler any more pitiable, he is an evil mastermind at the end of the day, but it gives an insight into his motivation, his bioterrorism almost serving as a vehicle of vengeance for his persecuted forefathers and giving the game world greater cohesiveness, rather than just having it be a generic rock in the sea. Sadler himself doesn't make a proper appearance until much later, whereas he'd previously interacted more with Leon, including popping up to stick it in Luis. He feels more mysterious and intimidating even if he gets less screen time. He makes his presence known by being able to possess Ashley from afar, as well as forcing her to carry out an abhorrent act in his proper reveal scene. Another part that caught me off guard was in the castle courtyard when Ashley innocuously coughed. In the original, she coughed up blood and ran away from Leon due to being scared of her condition, promptly being recaptured. Here, the cough signposts the same event, but it takes on a darker tone as Ashley is suddenly manipulated into attacking Leon and then seemingly runs away in fright at her uncontrollable actions. This slight deviation serves to signal how much more threatening Los Illuminados are in that Sadler can freely use our protagonists like puppets, as though you're not in control and the entire game is just him toying with you. We also learn more details of Ramon Salazar, which make him a much more unsettling, fearsome villain. Napoleon represented much more in his mental complex than just his clothing. Journals found in the castle describe how he mutilated a servant after they called him Pulgarcito, Tom Thumb in Spanish, and how his illness should have killed him in his youth. This sadistic, insecure child has manifested as an unhinged, frightening, diminutive despot that rules over the village today. I preferred his original boss fight mechanically, as I found this one much more frustrating, but it's thematically fitting since he's now more intimidating even in human form. His dialogue during the battle is certainly more interesting now. In the past, I don't recall him saying anything of note, but now he calls Leon a tiny, ugly, sickly halfwit and a demon child who should never have been born, as though taking out his own insecurities on our hero. In reality though, Salazar is every bit as much a pathetic, snivelling underling. He shows a sycophantic, obsessive devotion to Lord Sadler, and the Los Illuminados cult prey on his wicked, corrupt heart to get him to undo the good work of his ancestors who had sealed the Plagas away under the castle. The little lord sees himself as being something of a second in command, but he isn't. If we remember from the original, Sadler sees Salazar as small time, leading to Leon's comeback of the year. Sadler, you're small time. And although this line is cut, he likely cares nothing for him here either. Salazar instructs Krauser to mention him to Sadler when he delivers the kidnapped Ashley, but even if Krauser were to, Sadler wouldn't care. To him, Salazar is just another expensable cultist, and it's evident in his death scene as he now begs for help from his uncaring master as he's crushed under the weight of his own grotesque devotion. Speaking of Krauser, he was always a confusing element of RE4 to me. As I discussed in my RE7 video, my knowledge of the series was patchy for the longest time. 4 was the first one I played, and I figured that Krauser must have appeared in a previous entry. But nope, he was just this ex machina character who had an apparent past association with Leon, came out of nowhere and forced you into insufferable QTE knife fights. He later starred in the Dark Side Chronicles in 2009, but even if he hadn't, RE4 Remake manages to build this random character into a layered, almost sympathetic antagonist. He's a figure similar to Kurtz from Heart of Darkness and Apocalypse Now, a former soldier gone rogue who was inspired to work for Wesker after witnessing the capabilities of bioweapons on a mission to South America. In the remake, he's instead now driven by an insane desire for power, after having a twisted road to Damascus moment during said mission in which he was abandoned by the US government, and joins Los Illuminados of his own free will to aid in their global domination. He's also retconned as not just being Leon's comrade, but his superior who trained him, about which he lords it over our protagonist. During their final fight, Krauser also says that he and Leon are two sides of the same coin, which is true. Both have been profoundly affected by their military pasts, but have chosen radically different paths in order to address their trauma, Krauser having fallen to the dark side in a selfish pursuit of power, Leon still fighting for what's right despite his internal conflict. It makes Krauser's taunts like, You can't save her. You can't save anyone. And, You haven't changed a damn bit. <laughs> what a disappointment. Cut particularly deep, almost a manifestation of Leon's self-doubt. Krauser kind of becomes symbolic of the emotional weight that Leon carries and has to kill Krauser to free himself, but this in itself adds an extra layer of tragedy to the story. Leon is out to make things different this time by saving someone, but to cut ties with his past and move on, he has to put down his old mentor. I love how we first see Krauser reflected in the blade, and then Leon reflected in it in the same way after taking it from him, having usurped his superior as Krauser's dying words linger with him. This is the only time in the game that Krauser refers to Leon by name instead of Rookie or similar, as though finally recognising him as an equal, or at least a worthy adversary. 
putting Leon one step forward in overcoming his affliction and justifying his choice to follow the path of righteousness. Leon replies in a similarly respectful manner and visibly laments this enemy's death, something not often seen in the series and something that gives them a unique dynamic. Now you did, Major. Now you did. Even the more lowly enemies are fleshed out, such as the famine faced by the Ganado villagers. The village records describe the crops withering and the cows growing thin under Sadler's tyranny, to the point that they have to slaughter five of the animals. The entries after that then make for grim reading, as they start detailing not the multiple sacrifices of cows, but the sacrifices of villagers themselves. I thought this might have been to ease the pressure in terms of having fewer people to feed, but they then get to skip sacrifice day after two hitchhikers wander into their midst, suggesting the killings were in honour of Lord Sadler rather than for survival. Ganados translates from Spanish as cattle, and that's how they're chillingly portrayed within these pages. Valle de Lobos was never exactly a welcoming place, but like Resident Evil 7, knowing that its murderous inhabitants were once innocent working family people makes witnessing its current state an experience as sad as it is scary. There's also now an even more sinister tale attached to the crazed bioengineering experiments that led to the creation of some of the game's most intimidating enemies. Isidro Uriarte Talavera was a servant of Ramon Salazar tasked with genetic experimentation, carried out on other denizens of the castle including a housekeeper who had been loyal to Salazar's father, Diego, and had tried to keep his son on the straight and narrow. You can find her memos dotted around and there's a dramatic shift in tone between them, from despair at having failed to keep Salazar safe from evil to joy at having been implanted with the Plagas and leaving her mortal shell to become a subservient abomination. Talavera says the housekeeper graciously volunteered herself to do so, but somehow I don't think that's quite the case. There's a tragic irony that while she was in her right mind, she wrote that she would watch over Ramon until the end, a promise that she would ultimately keep, human or otherwise. Originally, this servant fused with Salazar within the Queen Plaga, but simply disappeared during the remake after Season Ashley. This mystery was eventually resolved in the DLC, in which it tracks Ada and is ultimately revealed to be the scorpion-like U3 enemy, which had been absent from the main campaign. This female creature is dubbed Pesanta, named after a cryptid from Catalan folklore, a large black dog that lies on top of sleeping people to give them nightmares, much like other artistic depictions of sleep paralysis. This image isn't too far off the idea of a lap dog, a taunt fittingly used by Leon during the boss battle with Talavera himself. The mad scientist journals make him sound seemingly jealous of the housekeeper having become Salazar's right hand, and so he undergoes his own abnormal apotheosis to become not a lap dog, but a verdugo. Or executioner. This was always one of the game's most tense, nerve-wracking segments, but to know that this thing was once a living, thinking human who's willingly transformed himself and others into some insectoid apex predators is an unthinkable level of psychological body horror that really highlights this nutter's devotion to the cause. Given even these minor characters an update contributes to the immersive unease at the heart of the game, bolstering an already infamous world of horror. And that's what makes Resident Evil 4 2023 so successful. It's a cliche, but Capcom truly succeeded in retaining what was great about the original while tightening up the character development in a revitalised version I didn't know we needed. That's not to say that it makes RE4 2005 obsolete. That'll always be a special title, with its own unique features and of the time charm, but the remake changes its tone and twists anticipation to forge its own identity, continuing the developer's ever-improving skill for game design and storytelling. Chalk that up as a win. Now let's see what they do with Resident Evil 5. That chicken just totally ruined the shot.